And today I'm going to talk about the existence of God. Okay, the existence of God. And if you would, just open your Bibles up to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and we'll get started and uh, uh, let you know here. I'll give you a couple of minutes of what we've done in the past uh, couple of years. We were about a year and a half, uh, see, two, two years ago in August, this coming August, we uh, ended up uh, going down to Covert Baptist Church, which is down in Interlaken, New York, quite a ways from me. How many of you know where Interlaken is? Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. And uh, Covert Baptist Church was uh, founded in 1803. And uh, it, it had been con- continued on, but it got in real bad shape. There was only three people coming there. And then counting my wife and I, we made up five uh, to start with. <clears throat> so we kept it open. We kept going there for a, uh, for a year and a half. And we finally got a pastor. Uh, his name is Adam Porter to take the church over. And uh, he's uh, continuing to preach there. He's been down there since, since January. So... Uh, we hope and pray that uh, I just talked to him last night. He said things are coming along, coming along slow, but they're still coming along. And uh, if you can remember them, uh, remember them in prayer because uh, <clears throat> I hope he doesn't get discouraged and that uh, he continues on down there and does a great work down there. It's a work that's uh, out in the country, but this church proves you can build a work out in the country. Amen? Okay. So I'm hoping he'll uh, do that. And then we filled in in several other churches uh, over the past year, in uh, two or three years since we've been here. And uh, just great to be back here again and, and to see you folks again, all right? John chapter 1, all right? John chapter 1, Word of God says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him and without Him, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many, many blessings you've given to us. Uh, Most of all this morning, we thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all that he has uh, uh, done for us and continues to do. And Lord, we thank you for the great sacrifice that he made on our behalf. And we pray that throughout this day that we might be able to lift up his name and glorify his name uh, with the glory that he should have. Father, I just pray that you'd bless this Sunday school hour and the hours to come, Lord, uh, that you might help me to bring forth the very words that we need to hear today. And I pray, Lord, that you'll bless them and bless each and every one here today. For we do ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Now, uh, I guess we might say if we we're ever going to start a Bible doctrine class, we'd probably start with the existence of God. And, and I'm not going to bring this message with the idea that nobody in here believes in God. I'm not, trying to, I'm not going to try to prove God to you this morning. But I think these are some things that we can go over that will help you when you're witnessing to those on the outside that don't believe there's a God or don't know whether there's a God or not. And these will give you some arguments that you can use. Uh, By the way, there's hundreds and hundreds more than what I'm going to go through here today. So uh, don't ever give up studying on this uh, particular subject. It's a very interesting one, and you'll find an awful lot uh, in your Bible. So uh, if we're going to begin, anybody who's ever going to begin a Bible doctrine class, they'd have to begin, I think, with the existence of God. But honestly, honestly, we're constantly challenged by atheists and skeptics and hecklers uh, to prove that there is a God. Uh, Sometimes I think we need to reverse the thing and say, well, just prove there isn't one. Amen? Okay. But it's kind of difficult for the natural man to believe in something that he cannot see, uh, touch, feel, uh, or hear uh, directly, and we can find over here in in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse uh, uh, 14, the reason why is uh, the natural man says, but the natural man receiveth not the things 
of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually uh, discerned. Uh, they don't have any spiritual connection. You know, in the book of Ephesians, it says, it's talking to believers, it said, and you hath he quickened, in other words, made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And somewhere along the line, when man sinned, uh, he, he lost his spiritual contact with God. He's actually not alive unto God. He may be alive in the flesh, but he's not alive uh, unto God. Now, God has still left them with some faculties and some, the ability to reason, the, the ability to think, and to uh, uh, observe things in, in creation and all that. So there's enough in man that he should be able to see that there is a God. And I believe that if a man is looking for God, God will uh, lead him to the truth. Unfortunately, a lot of people are not looking for God. They're trying to find a way to get away from God. And so they need people like us to come around and every now and then uh, give them a little uh, a prodding and remind them that there is a God and that someday they're going to have to face him. Amen? So, uh, but anyway, they don't, want to, they don't want to acknowledge that in the natural state. Uh, we, when we get saved, we don't have any problem acknowledging that. Amen? Okay? The problem for the Christian is solved in the very first verse, verse of the Bible where it says, in the beginning, uh, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, once a person can get a hold of that, uh, then by the way, if a person ever stops and thinks that if there's, a, if, if there's a being that spoke the heavens and earth into existence, which he did, there is absolutely nothing in this Bible that is miraculous to God. Okay? And uh, if we understand that he's all that all that powerful, there's no miracle in here that we should deny. Because it's easy. Even the resurrection is child's play to God compared to this immense creation that he created. So I think you see what I'm saying, saying there. Okay? But the Bible is not, was not written as a textbook that attempts to prove the existence of God. The Bible just opens up the very first verse with a positive fact that God does exist. It did not occur, occur anywhere in the Bible for any writer to, to think that they had to <clears throat> prove the existence of God. They just all wrote, uh, with a, as a matter of fact, that there is God. All right? It was just assumed uh, that there is a God. So the Bible plainly states that it is a fool who denies the existence of God. Psalm 14.1 says, The fool that said in his heart, there is no God. And that is kind of a foolish statement to make. Uh, for them to prove that, they'd have to, they'd have to be able to go through the whole universe, all right? And they can't even do that. But anyone with any intelligence, I believe, would acknowledge the evident fact of a living God. And I believe the greatest proof apart from scriptures of the existence of God is our, our daily fellowship with him in prayer. But the unsaved will never understand that. I know that there's a God because I talked to him this morning uh, and I prayed to him and I believe God with all my heart heard me and I believe that God answers me back. All right, now I don't hear it in an audible voice, but I do hear it in the word of God and I do believe that he brings up a lot of the, the good thoughts in my mind, okay? But we'll look first of all at the proof from scripture and if you'll turn your Bibles to uh, Psalm 19, Psalm 19, and look at uh, verse 1. It says, The uh, heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. The beauty and glory of the heavens speak loudly, saying, God exists. Does it not? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. When you look out there at the creation... Uh, you look at the stars and everything out there. You see that? You look right down here on the earth. and I look over there. I'm looking at some white flowers on a bush and the green grass. And you see all the trees and all of that. The animal life and everything else. 
you have to admit somebody, somebody must have created it. Somebody must have brought it forth into existence. So I believe that all of that glory of the heavens and everything else speaks loudly saying that God does exist. God does exist. In Romans chapter uh, 1, Romans chapter 1 and in uh, verse 20, Paul writes here, he says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Notice he said the invisible things of Him. Now we know that uh, uh, everything that we see in here is made out of molecules, uh, made out of atoms and molecules. By the way, those atoms are made out of even smaller things, such as electrons, protons, and neutrons, <laughs> and totally not visible with the, na with the eye, uh, unless we have huge, uh, uh, extremely powerful microscopes. But uh, uh, anyway, we know that those things exist, and yet everything in here is made out of those basic components. And they've been put together in a certain way. And yet all of those things are moving constantly, and yet this, this whole top of this thing is moving. Uh, all those atoms and protons are moving around in there. There's no connection between any one of them. They don't, none of them touch one another. And yet it's solid to me, and it stays in this shape. I, I mean, that's amazing. Now, you know, it's, it's only the power of the Lord Jesus Christ that holds that thing together. It, it, it talk, talks about, by him, all things consist. It means they're literally held together in the book of Colossians. Okay? So uh, uh, we see that. And uh, the invisible things from him, from the creation of the world, are clearly seen. So the invisible things of God are clearly seen by the things that are made. All right? And we can, they can be understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that... Anybody that looks at creation and thinks about it with any, uh, with any thought has got to come to the conclusion that there is a God, a creator. And maybe they don't call him God, maybe they call him the creator. But uh, there is an all-powerful person out there that does this. The man who accepts scripture will readily acknowledge the existence of God. I don't think any of us in here have any problem acknowledging God. And so we'll look at some of the other uh, evidences here and see what we've got. Uh, number one, or number, I should say number two, I already went through number one. We have the proof from conscience. The proof from conscience. Man is born with a universal belief in some supreme being. There has never been a, a tribe... Uh, that has been found even in the remotest parts of the earth, uh, that has not had some, uh, some uh, knowledge of God and God's existence. Uh, they may call them by different names, but it's an amazing thing. Uh, most, well, most of the tribes uh, all have some sort of a, uh, a creation story, and they all have some sort of a... Uh, a flood and ruin, or should I say, ruin and reconstruction theory uh, story. In other words, a flood and a, a remaking of the earth and all of that. <clears throat> They're corrupted in a great way, but yet they still have some of that evidence that is built into that society. Okay, and uh, so I believe that they know that there's some being that creates and controls, and I believe every person has that belief in them to start with. They may not know what it is or how, how to define it, but they know that there's something far above them in power, okay? A person far, a far greater than them in power. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 2 and verse 15, uh, Paul says this. He says, uh, uh, well, let's go back to verse 14. It said, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, 
their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Every society has some certain laws that they believe man has to follow. Uh, they all know that it's not right to steal. They all know that it's not right to, uh, uh, to have an adulterous relationship uh, w- with someone else. Uh, they seem to all know this. Uh, they have certain things that are built to, into them. Uh, they know that they have a, uh, they're supposed to have a certain love for one another. Where do they get this from? It's built into their person. It's part of their makeup, all right? So where did it come from? And Acts, uh, 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 I, I should say, uh, again, to go back into verse 15, it said, we show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So the existence of God is written in the human conscience. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 23, Paul writes there, he says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Uh, So, in in other words, their conscience told them, uh, even though they had thousands of gods lining the streets, and according to the estimations that I have read uh, about the number of Greek gods was somewhere in the vicinity of three, or excuse me, 30,000 gods that they had some kind of worship to. Uh, but they still realized there was one they didn't know, and the one they didn't know was the creator of the heavens and the earth. And that's what Paul used to talk to them about. But it was conscience that told them there was a God, even, they, even though they did not know him personally. Now, some atheists may claim that their conscience does not tell them about God. Uh, personally, uh, if, if they do, I believe that's a doubtful statement. I think it's a doubtful thing if you could ever really find a genuine atheist, someone who absolutely, beyond any shadow of a doubt, really deep down in did not believe, that, uh, uh, did, 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 did at least think that they might be wrong. You understand what I'm saying? And uh, although they might uh, argue that outwardly, uh, I don't think they would. I guess it's been said in wartime that there's no, uh, uh, no atheists found in foxholes, right? Okay. And uh, that's not the time to stand up for atheistic belief, right? Amen. All right. Okay. But, you know, some men are so blind that they may deny the existence of the sun in the sky, but it doesn't change the fact that the sun exists. Uh, we know that uh, electricity exists, but we can't see it. Okay, We know that wind exists, but we can't see that either. All right, And uh, we'd be foolish to deny some things if we, just because we could not see them. All right, But none are so blind as those who refuse to see or to analyze and recognize truth. The honest man will find that uh, the inner still small voice says that God exists and is alive today. Man, I should say men, deny the existence of God, not because they cannot find him, but because they're afraid to face him Uh, and be responsible for what they have done. They don't want to be accountable to anybody. And they feel that once they can uh, uh, unloose the shackles of that, then they can just do whatever they want to and convince themselves that they're all right. So they become uh, like the uh, Israelites of old. They just, every man did that which was right in his own eyes, had nothing to do with God. But atheism is one of the devil's tools to put men to sleep without accepting salvation. And if and there's always somebody to come along and say, yeah, yeah, you're right, and so forth like that. You're, you're okay, I'm okay, you're okay. That's a false philosophy. Okay? The only thing, one that can make us right is the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, of the matter is, I couldn't uh, 
uh, I couldn't go to heaven on my own today. If, if, if the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't take me there and let me in the gate, then I'm not going to get there. Amen? Uh, if his shed blood won't do it, nothing will do it. All right. And, uh, but his shed blood will do it. And that's the only, that's the only thing I'm going to plead uh, if they ask me a bunch of questions when I come to the, uh, uh, come to the gates of heaven. I'm going to just say, hey, I'm just going to plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? All right? That's right. <laughs> I think that's all we need. Right. So if there is no God, they, they would say that if there's no God, then they're not responsible to anyone, that they can live and die as they please. Uh, but in the quieter moments of reflection, the conscience of every man whispers, there is a God and only fools deny it. Uh, I don't mind looking at an atheist in the eye and just tell him, you know, I don't believe a thing you're saying. You're just, you're just lying through your teeth, you know. I, I just challenge them with that. I don't, I don't believe it. To look up and see, uh, there was a time you could look up and see a plane and not see a pilot and say that the plane was pilotless, uh, but you can't say that anymore. <laughs> but somebody is operating that plane somewhere, okay? They might even be on the ground operating it, but somebody has to be operating that plane. It does not just take off and fly by itself, okay? And to say there, uh, saying there is no God simply because we cannot see him is a, a fool's way of looking at things. Very few of us have ever seen our brains. Anybody in here seen their brains? I don't even want to look at them. Yet we believe that we possess them uh, because of a centralized control system in the body and because we see creation and we believe God and we know that other people have said we do have a brain. I realize that somewhere along the line, somebody has, might have said, do you have any brains? <laughs> All right, but uh, we do. So then there's the, uh, not only the uh, uh, argument from uh, conscience, but there's the argument from cause. This is call, called the cosmological uh, argument. And by that, we mean this simply this. The world is here. All right? It must have come from somewhere. Somebody or something must have caused it to come into being at one time or another. We look at this here. There's a book. Someone must have written it. No printing press can of itself produce a book, be it ever so modern a press with the latest uh, electronical gadgets in the world, uh, computers and everything else. It still is not going to print a book unless somebody uh, programs it and, and, and gives it the order to do such a thing. Someone built this building. We just thought, looked at the new addition back there. And by the way, that's nice. I like that. It looks really nice, all right? And I'm sure you guys have a lot of good fellowship out there, amen? Okay. But uh, someone built a building. That means someone, someone created the trees that it came from. Someone, uh, I, I, I should say... Uh, uh, someone designed that building back there. Somebody must have had some sort of a plan to put it together. And they must have followed a plan in putting it together. Somebody must have put it together, and, uh, which they did. It's the same with the universe. And the only sensible answer to the problem of the existence of the world is the existence of an intelligent being whom we call God. Now, I've got a a little, uh, I've got a track here. I wish I had a bunch of these. I'd give them out, but I don't. I only have one left, so I'm going to have to make a bunch of copies of this before I get some new ones. But in this tract, it gives the four possibilities of the existence of creation. So number one, the universe came from nothing naturally. That's the first statement. The second uh, possibility would be the universe, I shouldn't even say possibility, but I guess these are things that men come up with. The universe throughout eternity has always been here. Third is the universe is only an illusion that really isn't here. Okay. And then fourth is the universe came into being suddenly and supernaturally. Now, to answer those arguments, and by the way, I don't think there's any other possibilities 
that can possibly exist. Uh, you know, they never put this in a textbook. You'll never see that. And the National Education uh, Association will never print these four possible explanations to the most critical, crucial question facing science in the textbooks. And there's a reason why. Because they're intellectually dishonest. It's the same with those that promote the uh, evolutionary theory. But let me look at the arguments here. First, uh, first of all, the universe came from nothing naturally. The universe could not have come from nothing naturally because neither matter nor energy can be created or destroyed according to the first law of thermodynamics. These are scientific laws that scientists have come up with. Okay. Second, the universe could not be eternal for it would have devolved into a cold, dead, dark mass long ago according to the second law of thermodynamics which teaches that entropy or uh, energy that is uh, it, entropy is energy that's unavailable to work it's still there but it becomes useless as time goes on okay uh, it always increases in a closed system so it had to be some something on the outside that powered it then the third one is is the universe is only an illusion uh, that really isn't there uh, I guess we might say uh, that would only be a fool's, uh, a fool's thought. It'd be like you or me looking at you and say you don't exist, or you looking at me and say you don't exist. Uh, it, it would be just pure nonsense. The fourth one is the universe came into being suddenly and supernaturally. And that's the only reasonable, logical, scriptural, and sane choice left is that the universe came into being suddenly and supernaturally according to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He's the glue that keeps everything together. Isn't that amazing? It really is. You realize if our Lord Jesus Christ ever fell asleep, uh, we'd just disappear. We'd be nothing. Just disappear into nothingness. All right? But he doesn't. All right? He's always on the job and keeping things together. So uh, we could ask ourselves this question. Uh, if, if all the pieces of a watch were placed in a can, and that can was shaken gently for a million years. The watch would not suddenly and accidentally be put together and running. It just wouldn't work. So the argument from cause gives us a strong argument for God. Then there's the argument from design. This is what they call the teleological argument. I'll give you some uh, uh, theological terms here. Uh, if you want to write them down, fine. If you don't, you'll probably never need them again. But you could use them to maybe impress someone else you're talking to. Teleological. Uh, and the idea there is that the watch not only exists, but it has a designer. In other words, it was planned for a specific purpose. So the watch was not designed for, uh, for anything else. It wasn't designed to be a habitat for any... Uh, any type of insects or anything like that. It was designed uh, with, by a keen mind for the purpose of accurately keeping track of time and, uh, and telling the time. Now, an examination of the world and the things large and small shows that each of us is designed by an intelligent mind for a specific purpose in life. We know that uh, animals have different purposes in life, and we do too. You know what our main purpose is now that we're Christians? Our, our, our main purpose is to, uh, is to glorify God. That's exactly what it is. We're to be his witnesses out here and telling others about the Lord Jesus Christ and doing everything that we can to bring honor and glory to the Lord God Almighty. All right, so 
Uh, that is our real purpose. Uh, I was, I was going to say that when we look at purpose, uh, we can look at the animal life, and we can see that the different colors that they have, how God has designed them so that their colors help them defend themselves. Uh, sometimes it's to hide them. Sometimes it's to, I believe it's to uh, flash something in front of other animals that kind of frightens them away and so forth like that. But they all have certain natural defenses. And uh, then uh, we look at ourselves and realize that in every single cell of your human structure, there is a complete, and I said complete, nothing else needs to be added, uh, complete DNA code for the rest of your being. Isn't that amazing? Uh, they have, they've unraveled uh, the DNA code, and uh, I don't see how any doctor or scientist can ever, ever uh, believe in anything but that a superior intelligence to man, all right, laid this all out and uh, figured out how, what it was going to do. Uh, I've got a, a uh, videotape, video, a CD home, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, what do you call it, Di uh, video disc, okay. Uh, but in, in there it's got some graphics on it and it shows the DNA, uh, what the DNA does, and then there's another part of the DNA and that's called RNA, okay? And the RNA is designed so that it will replicate the DNA completely. It's got its own replication machine in there. Isn't that amazing? So that every cell in your body has the same DNA structure throughout it. And uh, yet some of them are assembled for the eye, some are assembled for, the, for a hand and a, and a knee, and, and uh, other organs of the body and so forth like that. And yet, and it all depends on the way all of those things are sequenced and how the person comes out. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And uh, to think that that ever happened by chance. You ever think about evolution? If that happened by chance, you'd most likely be running around with a, you know, you might have an eyeball hanging off of your shoulder or maybe off of your kneecap. Uh, why, are you, why are you made in such a symmetry, a symmetrical uh, fashion? You have, you know, kind of balance. You've got two eyes, two nostrils, you've got a mouth in the center, uh, you've got ears on the side, and, uh, uh, it, it's, and, and we look at every human being, looks just about the same, yet there's a lot of difference between us. It's amazing, isn't it? And uh, how did that ever happen just by chance? You have in your, uh, in your cells, you have a little uh, thing called a, inside of a cell, it's called a bacterium. And that little bacterium is like a little truck in that shell, in that cell. You have uh, food that has to be taken into it to fuel it. And then you have waste that has to be taken out of it. And that bacterium is the truck that brings in the food to the cell and then carries out the waste out of the cell. And on that little bac that bacterium, there's what they call a flagellum motor. And that operates a little tail on the end of that thing that, that goes, I believe it's something like 50,000 50, RPMs uh, a minute. And it can switch speed instantaneously back and forth. And that moves about in the cell and brings the food in and takes it out. But that little flagellum motor is made out of uh, uh, a series of things, four or five different things. And if you were to take any one of them away, it could not work. Okay? I don't know if you're get, getting what I'm getting to is this. If you don't have a flagellum motor working in that bacterium inside of that cell, you won't have any cell that's alive. That cell can't live without it. So in other words, there's certain things that are just what they call irreducible machines 
They just can't work unless all components are there. And they all had to come together at the same time for it to work. So you've got the, all of these little components of a cell that all had to come together at one time in order for it to be a cell. And then you want me to think that that took place accidentally and that over time that somehow it managed to grow itself and uh, uh, design a human being and all of that? Uh, you're, you're crazy if you think I could ever think of that. I couldn't. I think that somebody knew what they were doing, put all the pieces together, and started it off. And that's God. Amen? So that's the teleological uh, uh, argument, uh, argument from design. Then there's the moral argument. And by the way, what time is Sunday school over? 25 after? I can make it. <laughs> I can make it. All right. The moral argument, and that's the anthropological uh, and that is that man has an intellectual and moral nature showing that the creator must not be simply an inanimate force, but a living, intelligent, moral being. In Genesis 1.26, we read the words that says, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then verse 27 says, God created man in the image and likeness of God, uh, that is, in other words, it was patterned after God. Our being was patterned after God. Uh, we are, a, a, just as God is a triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we are a triune being also. We're body, soul, and spirit. Amen? Okay. All right, so, and, uh, uh, and by the way, I want to say something else, too, and that's something that a lot of us forget about. Every person in here, is made even though, uh, even if an unsaved person is in here, every person that's made is made in the image of God. Okay, that's one of the reasons why, uh, if a man uh, strikes out and kills another man uh, with uh, with malice of forethought, uh, he's a person that should be put to death himself because he is himself struck out against the image of God. Okay. So anyway, uh, and then in Psalm 94, verse 9, it said, He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? You see, God has given man ears and eyes. He's also given him knowledge and intelligence and willpower, for these things are the things that he possesses. When I talk about us being made in the image of God, you need, you need to understand something. That God is infinite. He has all power, everything. But we are finite beings. But we have all of the attributes that God has. All of them. Okay. Uh, God loves, we love. God hates, did you know that? Some things God hates, we hate. God builds, we build. God tears down, we tear down. Okay. Uh, so in other words, we have all of those attributes. God has knowledge, we have knowledge. Only his is all knowledge, ours is limited. Everything that we do is limited. Okay. Uh, God has all time, we have a limited amount of time. So we have all of the attributes of God, and uh, so we need to remember that. Okay, uh, so anyway, conscience teaches man right and wrong, good and bad, for the creator is a moral being that is holy and uh, loves righteousness and abhors evil. Now we come to the life argument, and that is life comes from life, and the original life must have come from a being possessing eternal life. That is life that existed before physical life was created. And that's where we have Adam and Eve entering into the world. Okay? <clears throat> we can uh, look for that life, and the only place that we can find it is to be found in God who possesses eternal life. Psalm 36, verse 9 says, For with thee is the fountain of life, or 
the fountain we might understand as being the source. For with thee is the source of life, the fountain of life. The apple tree gets its life from the parent tree, the lamb from a mother sheep. But where did they get life from? We have to go back to the original creation there in Genesis chapter 1. And we find that, uh, that the, the uh, uh, plants uh, brought forth after their own kind with their, with their own seed. They bore their own seed and then uh, brought forth after their own kind. We find that the animals went forth and they brought forth after their own kind. And then when uh, uh, human beings grow up on the earth, they bring forth what? After their own kind. All right. And so we have to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 to find life. And then Jesus said uh, in John chapter 11 and verse 25, he said, I am, uh, let's look back there, John chapter, uh, John chapter 11, in verse 25, uh, he's talking to Martha, he said, he said, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Notice he said, I am, not only the resurrection, but he said, I am the life. In John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Uh, the point is being is, he is the life. And then in John chapter uh, uh, 10, and verse 28, it said it in, uh, in verse 27, he said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And he said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's a great verse on eternal security, uh, which I believe uh, uh, completely. And I believe that once we become one of God's children, we're never cast out of the family. We might, <laughs> we might come under some, uh, what shall I say, uh, chastisement as we walk through the face of this, uh, over the face of this earth, but we're always his children, always his children. Okay. And then there's uh, one last argument I'm going to bring here, and we'll be done here in just a couple of minutes, and that's the argument from congruity, and that is the theory of atheism solves absolutely no problems but multiplies unsolved mysteries. Remember that. It does not solve any problems. It only multiplies unsolved mysteries. The acceptance of the existence of God as creator of the world is like a magic key that fits all the facts of Scripture, all the facts of Revelation. By that, I'm not talking about God communicating with you, necessarily. But I'm talking about all the facts of Scripture and Revelation by what we can actually verify out here on this earth uh, through knowledge and science. Everything falls in harmony. And if anything disagrees with the Bible, it's because we don't have it right. We just don't have it right. When Paul made those statements about... Uh, being able to understand this earth by the invisible or the things of God by the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world, uh, he was literally making a, a, a statement on atomic and molecular theory uh, that scientists didn't even know anything about back then. Way ahead of his time, the Bible's always way ahead of its time. Some people say it's an old book and it's out of date. It's a future book. It not only tells you about the past, but it tells you about the future. Acceptance of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God leads a sincere seeker into the path of fuller revelation of God himself. And I might only, not only say that, not only God himself, but of what life is all about. What the challenges are and how to meet those challenges. Hebrews 11.6 says, He that cometh to God must believe that he is, 
and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Uh, when, it say, when it says, it must believe that he is, that means you must believe that he exists. Okay. By the way, as long as I said that, let me say one other thing. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. I may have told you this before. The evidence of things not seen. Now what is, how many, how many different ideas of faith do we have in here today? If I would ask you to define faith, what would you say faith is? Yes. Yeah, that's you're 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 right on. You, you haven't got the exact definition, but you're right on. Okay, the word and, and now faith is the substance of things. Faith it says now faith is the little word is in there. That's a being verb, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That means that faith is something that you can grab a hold of, that you can touch, you can see. Say, what is that? That's this book. That's this book. That's the substance of things hoped for. His word. And then it says, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, I have not seen Jesus Christ. I have not seen a heaven itself and all of those things. But the evidence is right here. It's in this book. So faith is built on the word of God. And so Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, okay? And we can get into a whole other message on that, but uh, that's the Godward side of faith there, okay? But that's what God wants you to trust his word absolutely uh, 100%. Amen? All right. It's getting late. Anybody got a question they want to ask? Okay, it means you understand everything I said, right? I'm not even sure I did. All right, let's bow our heads and we'll be dismissed with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the time we've had together. I pray, Lord God, that somehow uh, the, the, the simple, frail words of this preacher would somehow, uh, through your Holy Spirit, be ordered up in each one's mind in here to make some sense and help bring them to a greater understanding of your word and your ways, Lord, that we might serve you in a way that would be pleasing to you and bring honor and glory to thy name. We ask it, Lord. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen. Amen.